Welcome back. For this house, for the time being, we're done with the utility work in the crawl space. We've done the sewer, water, and HVAC ducting. Later, we will need to put in a small amount of natural gas. The big thing that will be done in our crawl space is the insulation. It'll be placed and pushed and secured into the cells between the eye joists, but that needs to wait until the house has walls and a roof. We don't want to risk that insulation being soaked with rainwater and it's just absolutely certain that there will be one or two times when there will be rain you know that's going to be coming along before the roofs on this place so we leave the insulation out until pretty much the end of the process putting the decking on a subfloor system like this is a lot like putting concrete on um, compacted fill your concrete is never going to be any better than the compacted fill and the deck is never going to be any flatter or quieter than the preparation you put into the framework, in this case, these engineered wooden I-beam Boise Cascade eye joists If they're not flat, if they're not held up properly, if they're not fastened, you know, your deck is gonna have problems. So we've paid close attention. I think we've got all the bugs worked out. One of the things about these top flange hangers, I mean, they go on easy and they're kind of intuitive and they work great, except it's been a few days since I put this mud sill on the top of this foundation and it's been sunny and so the moisture has been pulled out of this pressure treated board and the outside edge is bolted down tight but the inside of this all the way around has curled up a little bit it's curled because it's shrinking on this side up towards the sun besides that being pulled down hard on the outside tends to lift the inside so the inside of this board is just a little higher I don't I don't really want to overreact to that because when I put the weight of the house on there, you know, when there's when there's two or three or four hundred thousand pounds of structure sitting down here, this board's going to press down flat. But I am putting an eighth of an inch shim on here to sort of compensate for the distance of the top flange and the uh, framing fastener nails. I mean, they're up a little proud, puts a joist up a little proud. So we're up just a little bit right here. I think that's going to get the bottom plate of this wall sitting nice and flat, putting a steady down load on the ends of these joists so they don't squeak in the hangers. And hopefully we'll make a nice flat place to start the bottom plate coming up on these walls. This is the three quarter inch OSB tongue and groove decking that we're gonna use. I like it. The sheets are light enough that you can move around, but they are perfectly flat and they're gonna lay nicely on these joists. There's some controversy about OSB versus plywood and we'll go into depth on that here in a few minutes. But right now, what we are going to do is snap a line four feet from the edge of the building. That's because we're going to rip the tongue side of this sheet off and then we will be laying the tongue side of the future sheets into the groove side of the sheets that are in place. That's important. You don't want to be trying to push your sheet onto the existing sheets from the tongue side because you'll break the tongue off then you'll have a problem. It's a good idea you've got to snap a line to start this. I mean it's really important that this be straight end to end and it's really important that your first course be nice and straight otherwise you know any deviation from straight that you have in your first course is going to grow across the floor and by the time you get you know five or six courses over you're going to have big nasty butt joints that are just no good and it's a problem and it slows you up. Now your butt joints don't have to be tight in fact the manufacturer specifies and requires that the butt joints are not tight. They like to have a little space, you know, as much as an eighth of an inch. That bugs me. I hate to leave an eighth of an inch gap. So I, you know, I, I bring them up to where they're maybe about as open as maybe the thickness of a nickel. That's an old carpenter's measurement that used to apply to hanging doors. But just leave a little space at the butt joints and don't work yourself to death driving the tongue and groove seam tight. 
you need to leave a little room for these things to grow and shrink as it rains or as humidity goes up and down, which by the way is one of the real strong suits of OSB. If it gets wet, it's going to puff up. The edges will fuzz up and raise up and swell a little bit, but when it gets dry, it'll go right back down, unlike a plywood, wherein even a good grade of, of uh, tongue and groove subfloor can, if it stays wet enough, long enough, delaminate. And then you've got those top laminations making these bubbles that just really can't be fixed out in the middle of your floor. So this is not enough OSB to, to uh, deck both the ground floor and the second floor. I'll probably have to get a little more. Heck, maybe a lot more. I don't even know how many sheets are here. But I just want to go on record as saying I love OSB on a subfloor and I love it on a roof. It's a good material. And it's for my money and for my perspective, you just can't do any better. As with almost every other process in carpentry, the first course, the first wall, the first rafter, whatever it is, the first one is the one that goes slowly because you're putting together your system. That is doubly true on this because the starter course on the edge of this house has about, I don't know, maybe a dozen, maybe a dozen and a half penetrations that have to be located pretty closely if you're going to get this sheet to drop in. So. I've got to get the holes marked, I've got to get them drilled, I've got to check the fit, I've got to get some glue under there and then drop it back in place and make sure it comes very close to this four foot, half inch line that we snapped out in the middle on these joists. One of the big attractions, the selling points of a, of a uh, wooden eye joist floor system is that they're flat because all the members are the same width. And you can mess that up in a moment if you leave a big chip of wood or a pebble or something gets stuck in the glue and you just go ahead and drop a sheet on there, you're going to have a lump. You're going to have a high spot in your floor that essentially will never go away and will possibly cause a squeak. So be sure to have some sort of a brush or at least pay attention and you know get anything that you see that's out there that's in the wrong spot brushed off before you drop that sheet on. So this glue is actually way more important to this floor system than one might expect. If you've ever tried to tear off three quarter inch OSB or plywood from wooden eye joists, you know, years after it's been set up in a remodel or something, you will have learned that that glue, if it's well applied, makes the plywood, the sheet good and the joist one piece. That the wood itself will fail and will pull off of the bottom of the sheet and off of the top of the joist before the glue will separate sometimes. It essentially welds the sheeting to the joist. That is 
really way more important than simply whether or not you have a squeak in your floor, although those go away with a well-glued job also. The glue fills any, fills any incidental voids and welds the decking to the joist so that there's no way, no reason, no possibility of any movement between the diaphragm and the joist, which is, after all, what causes a squeak. If this staple gun looks like a nail gun, you can relax because it's not. I'm not driving any nails through this three-quarter inch tongue and groove decking into these I-beams because a nail introduces the possibility of a squeak. That straight cylindrical shaft on that nail gives a chance, if the glue doesn't bind real well, for a little vertical movement and a slipping, squeaking action around the shaft of the nail. So this staple gun is putting in staples, medium crown staples, inch and three-quarter leg, because in my opinion, a staple is not going to provide the same opportunity for a squeak as a nail, and I have to have something to hold these sheets in place while Lenny or Daniel come behind and put the screws in. So you can't wait around to get the screws in once your sheet's laying there on the glue, because you want the screws to clamp to squeeze that sheet down against that joist and squeeze that glue down just as tight as you possibly can. It's like the ultimate clamping system, right, to screw these things down. 12 inches on center in the field, 6 inches on center on the edges. I mean, now that's a clamp. And the screw is, as I mentioned, a number 10 because it has to have enough heft that it will be providing shear strength. You put about, I don't know, we're probably going to put 120, I don't know, maybe actually, we're probably going to put 75 pounds of screws out here in this deck. That's a lot of shear strength. And so it makes this floor really strong, which makes this foundation really strong so the backfill, the foundation's not retaining anything because of the screws and the diaphragm of the floor. So the screws are important. They're a Torx drive because I love Torx drive. We're going to put this whole deck in and probably only strip two screws, which is way better in my opinion than you would get with any other screw head configuration. The two and a half inch screw length is long enough to get full penetration through the three quarter inch decking and full penetration through the top flange of the wooden I-beam. The screw will be entirely encased. There'll be just a little bit sticking out the bottom for the insulation man to rake his knuckles open on in the crawl space, but aside from that, the screw is working perfectly. It's important that you have a little bit of shoulder on this screw that's smooth, no threads, so that when you have the threads engaged in the flange, the shoulder is slipping in the piece and will pull the piece down, rather than tending to create a space between the threads that are in the flange and the threads that are in the screw. So look it over, you'll have something in your neighborhood. These are suitable for use on, in the exterior on a deck, on composite um, decking material. That's what was available here and so we were in a hurry and we bought it. They don't have to be because you don't mind a little staining in your subfloor, but heck, if you can get them and if the price is the same, why not, right? Because your subfloor, I can guarantee you, at least around here, is gonna get wet a few times before the roof is finally on.
so having said all that about nails and all of that being true, there are plenty of floors that have been nailed down with ring shank nails and they're better. I mean, they are made to mimic the effect of a screw where there are ridges to keep it from, you know, moving. But I'll tell you this, if you are doing a job and you absolutely do not want to call back because of a squeak in your floor, you, got new, you have no choice. Screw it down. This OSB does not have a top and a bottom structurally, but it has a top and a bottom cosmetically. And that is because on one side there are lines that are painted onto the onto this material so that you can see when you're nailing off the joists where the center of your joists are. And the lines accommodate both 16 inch and 24 inch layout on your joists or your roof sheeting. That's handy. And the lines are straight enough that you can cut according to them as long as you keep an eye on it and realize you may have to go back and clean it up just a little bit when the next sheet butts into it. These lines for fastening are huge time savers because otherwise you're making marks and trying to find the joist and you're missing and have to take your fastener out or you're snapping across the sheet time after time after time while the glue is getting dry. So I recommend that when you're putting <laughs> when you pick up decking to put on your joists, you look for some and ask the lumberyard, is this going to have the centers, the lines, the nailing lines already in place? It's a time saver. Even though the joists and the decking is working at your ankles, I mean, rolling the joist, you're down low and you're on the, you're on the foundation and decking, you know, you're working at your feet and then you're walking on it. It's still framing. It's all framing. It's wood and it's sawdust and it's nails and it's screws. And I've got to say, I love it. It feels good to be back at that and be up out of the ground. So thank you for discovering and watching our house building series. I hope you're enjoying it. As always, thank you for watching essential craftsmen and keep up the good work.